Yes, we're open. Living Faith with Needham UCC, a sermon podcast from the Congregational Church of Needham United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. This sermon for Sunday, August 1st, 2021, is entitled Group Project. It's a reflection on a reading from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 and 11 through 16. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministry at the Congregational Church of Needham, simply head over to our website, www.needhamucc.org. Thank you. Our reading today comes from the New Testament of the Bible, from the letters of the early church, the epistles, from the letter to the church at Ephesus, that is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 and 11 through 16. Let's listen together for a living word from God for us in these words from Ephesians. I, Paul, the prisoner in the Lord, therefore beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is more than father and mother of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts Christ gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be childish, tossed to and fro, blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into the one who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Friends, God is still speaking to the world. May our hearts be open to listen and to respond. Amen. Anyone who's ever heard me preach more than once is likely to already understand that I appreciate the role of humor in preaching. In fact, I've put together whole worship services that talk about the humor of the gospel, the way that the gospel puts together unexpected people and situations and binds them together in love. That being said, it's rare that I actually begin a sermon with a joke. Now, partly that's for your own protection, because I understand myself. I know that my taste in jokes tends toward what we might call dad jokes, or I prefer to not gender that. I just call them groaners. And even those groaners that I like tend to be on the esoteric side. But I guess today is your lucky day, because I'm going to start my reflection today with not one, not two, but three jokes. And all three jokes follow the familiar good news, bad news formula. You know, well, I've got good news and I've got bad news. And hilarity ensues. But we'll see. Here goes. Joke number one. Two guys are hired to move a piano, to deliver an entire grand piano to a client on the 10th floor of a high-rise building. When they reach the ninth floor, the one in front says to the one in back, (laughs) well, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Sweating and grunting, the man in back says, tell me the good news first. Well, the good news is we only have one more floor to go. 
And the bad news? We're in the wrong building. But a bum, bum, shh. Joke number two. You know, the other day I was cleaning out my attic and I found an old violin and an old painting. So I called in an antiques appraiser to come and take a look. She examined both of them closely and then she looked up at me and she said, well, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Tell me the good news first. The good news is, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, that what you've got here is a Stradivarius and a Picasso. Wow! And the bad news? Stradivarius was a terrible painter. Thank you, thank you. And finally, joke number three. Famous physicist, Dr. Irvin Schrodinger, took his equally famous cat who had fallen ill to the veterinarian's office. He waited anxiously in the waiting room for an update on the cat's condition. Finally, after a long while, the vet came out and said to him, well, Dr. Schrodinger, about your cat, I have good news and bad news. I'm just gonna leave that one there for you and let you think it over. You can even Google it if you like. Schrodinger's cat. All of that is to preface this. I've got good news and bad news. In my sermon last week, I reminded us that on those occasions when we feel small and insignificant, like mere drops in the bucket, in the face of the great big thorny challenges of our world, racism, climate change, this interminable pandemic, or even just in the face of our own immediate challenges in our individual lives. The good news is this. We are not alone. We are in this together. And many drops can turn the wheel. Many drops can change the world together. The bad news is this. We are not alone. We are in this together. We depend on one another. Now that may not be exactly bad news, but it's not so great either. Because I don't know if you've met people. People are really, really people-y. And working together isn't exactly our forte. Sure, some people working together built the pyramids or the Great Wall of China, but that cooperation was coerced, elicited only under threat of the lash, violence as management philosophy, and I don't pretend that that is what Christ is calling us to. But when we're left to our own devices, we are decidedly less likely to share the load and the labor even when the prospective benefits for all are overwhelmingly positive. Getting human beings to work together, to pull together in the same direction for the benefit of all is, as they say, like herding cats. Or to take it a step further, as I like to say, after more than 20 years in congregational ministry, where the watchword is always autonomy, 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 with a side order of independence, it's more like herding squirrels. Not that we don't have plenty good reasons to be wary of the call to collective action. It's not like the risks of building the pyramids, of waging colonialism and war, of, I don't know, building our United States economy in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, and what the heck, let's throw in the 20th and the 21st while we're at it. It's not like all of that blood, sweat, and tears, all very literal, it's not like all of that was distributed equally across all shoulders. Now, was it? There's a reason we call it a pyramid scheme. But still, I don't think I'm being overly pessimistic here, calling a squirrel a squirrel. I think I'm just reading the daily news, where the overwhelming evidence seems to be when it comes to working together for the common good, 
that's not such a common attitude after all. We human beings can be awfully squirrely indeed. Pick an issue, any issue. Do I really need to tell you? Here we are, facing one of the worst, deadliest pandemics in the history of the human race. Where over 4.2 million people have died of COVID worldwide so far, more than 613,000 in the United States alone, and rising despite the ready availability of three different vaccines for free. Vaccines folks in other countries are literally dying for. True to squirrely form, some among us, so many among us, it turns out, have cast their own decisions not to get vaccinated or even just to wear a mask as a matter of prioritizing their own life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness over everyone else's life, period. That's a hell of a hill to die on. And yet people are dying there in droves, increasingly. So when I say, with a firm and full conviction of my faith, that I believe that salvation is a group project, that the faith we have received from Jesus Christ is not now or ever a matter of every man, woman, and child for themselves. That the point isn't, where am I going to end up after I die, so much as what are we going to do with the world while we're here? Given our all too human proclivity to selfishness, to childishness, or if that all sounds too grandiose, just given our all too common and bad experience with group projects in school, remember back to middle school. That may not sound like good news at all. The fact that we're in it together, that the gospel is a group project, that salvation will come for all of us or none of us. In fact, as I think about it now, I'm reminded of a quote attributed, rightly or wrongly, to Benjamin Franklin, who is said to have, upon signing his name alongside all the others at the bottom of the Declaration of Independence, pronounced in his own pitch-black gallows humor, we must indeed all hang together, or most assuredly, we will all hang separately. So there's some bad news, but here's some good. After all, the word gospel literally means good news. God knows. God knows us and all our proclivities. God also knows all our possibilities. And God has come among us in Jesus Christ, who indeed hang together on the cross crucified between two thieves and alongside countless others, ground up in the gears of a totalizing empire and individual individualistic sin, and moved through it and beyond to something previously unimaginable, resurrection. There's the good news. And at the very heart of this good news is this. Yes, sin and evil and selfishness are real. Jesus' cross was real. Our crosses are real. The crosses we impose on one another are real. Yes, the squirrels are running the nut house, running amok, running it right into the ground. But it doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to be this way. The good news of the gospel is that another way and another world are possible because God has created us for more than this. God has created and called and blessed and gifted us for more than this with so many more gifts and so many different kinds of gifts. 
That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about, writing from his own experience of incarceration at the hands of the powers and principalities of his day, as he cast his spirit out beyond his own personal prison walls to imagine all of that vast variety of God-given gifts. They gave him hope. The gifts Christ gave, he said, were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, some garbage collectors, some politicians, some craft makers, some supermarket grocery store workers, some doctors and nurses, some scientists, some forest rangers, and on and on and on. And God gave us these gifts, not for our own narrow purposes alone, but for the building up of the body of Christ. Until all of us may come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the beloved child of God, that we might come to maturity in the measure of the full stature of Christ. God knows us, but God has gifted us with more growth more ways to be and become, to work and to will in the world. Now, sure, Paul said, some people, okay, an awful lot of people, way more people than we'd hope, continue to be childish, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, believing this or that ridiculous thing, blown about by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, by our own trickery, by our own craftiness and deceitful scheming. But the good news remains, we can do better. We can be better together. As we think about the challenge of working together in the world, That is the prize upon which we're called to set our eyes. That we might find ways of building a spiritual unity, not an outward uniformity, but a unity of purpose, a commonwealth of all persons and all creation and all that God has made, that we might work with all humility and gentleness. And God knows it's going to take patience and bearing with one another in love and making every effort and going beyond and beyond that even to maintain and build this unity, this body together. An organic body full of a diversity of persons and a diversity of gifts. We are called to speak to one another in love but to speak the truth always, to challenge one another and to comfort one another, one hand after another, to seek ways to build one another up and ourselves as well. This is the first and great commandment that Christ shared with us, that loving God is to love one another and ourselves all together. This is the bad news and the good news, the gospel news for us as we survey our world and our place in it today. How can we build up not only the body of Christ, the church, this congregation and the church more broadly, but how can we build up the presence of God, abundant living for all whom God has made in the world? Just as I said last week, I'll say this week, and doubtless I'll say it again, our first and primary task is to build relationship with one another, to speak the truth in love, and to love one another in all of our hard truth, taking the bad news along with the good, just as God takes all of us. And so, friends, If you've heard the word of God preached here today, remember to give all honor and glory to our one God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit.